I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Karen Williams, the founder of High Tree Advisors, a new independent consultant that's helping organizations improve the effectiveness of their invested assets through practical quantitative metrics of risk. Karen is an engineer by training who previously was a partner at Wilshire Associates, the chief investment officer of Farmers Insurance Group, and head of client solutions at Hedge Fund Two Sigma. Our conversation covers the early days of financial engineering, taking lessons to portfolio analytics at Wilshire Associates, and discovering a disconnect in theory and practice with mean variance optimization and the application of early factor models. We then turn to Karen's applying risk frameworks and factors at Farmers Insurance, joining Two Sigma, and creating HiTree to help institutions measure risk practically. Today's show is sponsored by Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. Sophisticated multi-asset class investors need high-tech and high-touch data management solutions for their front and middle offices. Northern Trust Front Office Solutions combines high-powered functionality with exceptional client service to help asset allocators efficiently evaluate their portfolios, accelerate their insights, and mitigate their operational risk. Visit northerntrust.com slash solutions to learn more. Today's show is sponsored by Canalyst, the leading destination for public company data and models. In my brief time as a buy-side analyst a while back, the software available at best delivered simplistic financials with bad data. Canalyst's platform has exactly what you would want as an analyst. Detailed company-specific models on over 4,000 equities with clean data, appropriate adjustments, and relevant KPIs for each company informed by their small army of analysts. If you're not already a user, I strongly suggest you give Canalyst a try at canalyst.com slash TED. That's Canalyst with a C. Today's show is sponsored by iConnections iConnections software platform seamlessly connects managers and allocators for virtual meetings, giving managers the ability to subscribe and share information with allocators who can efficiently select and meet managers all on one platform. The scalable technology powering iConnections can be used for bespoke events by managers, allocators, and service providers. Visit iConnections.io to learn more. Please enjoy my conversation with Karen Williams. Karen, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Well, why don't we start just with your background and how you got into the whole investment world in the first place? It feels like a very long time ago now. <laughs> Think graduate student. I was about to finish up my PhD and I was invited by a professor of mine to create I guess, a financial engineering program at Claremont Graduate University. And he said, hey, you know, come teach, finish up your PhD. Let's help create this program. And moving to California and connecting to the investment community here through that program was my first step in. What else was going on in the quantitative world at that time? Oh, boy. <laughs> I think. Okay, so this was 98. So this was maybe not so early days of hedge funds. Certainly, it was the time was a precursor to, as you might imagine, day trading. The internet was just starting to really make itself known to the investment community. And the time was an interesting one of students who had come around the world into this program thinking that, you know, they were going out to the next hedge funds or, or trading platforms. A lot of them, funny enough, actually took their stipends and, and day traded <laughs> and believed that ultimately until 2001, that they knew how to trade markets. So a very interesting time and, and uh, a lot going on in the field of finance too. And so what was this model that you built then? My research was on the interbank market for foreign exchange. And I was writing about something called price discovery. I was very interested in the dynamics of information. 
and how people make decisions even then in markets. And so what I was looking for was, could we say something about how people formulate prices? What is important? What kind of information is important? Of course, there's permitted information, there's transitory information, the signal to noise. Could we make sense of how things worked dynamically in a particular market setting? And so there's a group called Olson and Associates at the time that dumped basically a million quotes on a tape and gave it to the academic community. And out of that was born some very interesting work. And if you've ever heard of the alphabet soup of arch, garch, egarch, igarch, like this is all about time varying variance. And so this was the application that I had studied at the time. So I probably should have made a hedge fund out of that, but I didn't. <laughs> we ended up in that program really creating one of the first of its kind in financial engineering, which meant bringing together some of the professors from the math department with the management professors at the Drucker School and thinking about, well, what it would it really require to have someone who's trained well enough to engage in portfolio design or trading, et cetera. So that's the start. That's where it all began. <laughs> what did you find or conclude in the research? The behavior of the interbank market is a lot of activity in beginning of the day, end of day, maybe even parts of the day. So you know, volatility changing quite a bit over time. And so I had information about the individual banks themselves that were contributing quotes to the market. And so you can imagine Deutsche Bank and, and South Gen and some of these big name banks. And I could see that they were active in markets at a certain time, but then there were smaller banks, tons and tons of smaller banks contributing quotes to the market. The analysis that I ran suggested that the prices were being updated by the smaller players, not the larger players. And that made sense to me because if you're going to put information in the market, move that market, you had a trade to make and somebody on the other side could perceive that as information. If you're the larger bank, it's possible to balance the trade internally so that you're not revealing information to the market. So I concluded that most of the discovery was happening with the smaller players in the marketplace. So anyway, an empirical piece, and ultimately for me, very, very early days, I was working with the engineering department on managing this huge corpus of quote data for a year. So a kind of early exposure to, if you will, data science and machine learning before it was called that. And so you could have gone to a hedge fund, you didn't. So what did you do after your PhD? So where you go from a PhD is you either take the academic route or you practice and there was a lovely mentor I had come to know at the Drucker School, and he said, look, there is so much to learn, and practice is really where I would encourage you to go. So I had a choice, and I decided to go to work for Wilshire Associates in California and dove into portfolio analytics, research, development, think engineering, and design of systems for institutional investors, and the early ones were asset managers, banks, mostly in Europe. So the mandate for me when I joined was to help to build risk models. So there were fixed income models, there were equity models, but there weren't total fund analytic models. So our group was charged with building total fund analytic models and really putting them into the hands of organizations that cared about the multiple asset class products or their own balance sheets, for example. And so early days working within analytics at Wilshire. So when you first dove into that work, what did you see just coming from your own training that you would quickly conclude, well, you know, like, that's stupid. Like, why did they do things that way? First and foremost, <laughs> I was surprised, really surprised that the mean variance optimization framework was applied directly and simply. Like even from early days, it didn't make sense to me that these concepts, really the point was to say something about how risk should be perceived, that it's systematic. These are lessons about how to think about risk, not necessarily to apply it. But I did see those applications everywhere and I thought it was, it was challenging. And then of course, 
different and away from that, there were people who didn't have any tools. So I felt like from very early days that there was this massive gap between theory and theoretical applications direct from the source to using nothing and maybe around the edges, some tools for attribution, but not in terms of real portfolio construction. I think that was probably early days of those tools coming to market. Think Bara, think, you know, but yeah, it was surprising to me. And so I thought, well, there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot of work to do here. And getting into that, that work, and there's a kind of a little side story here. At one point, we undertook a strategic relationship with the Bank of New York. It was a really fun project that we worked on. And we involved ING and Harry Markowitz. And we did a survey, a risk survey of a lot of people and a lot of different institutions, clients of Wilshire, ING, and the bank. And you know, we put together this survey, said some things about risk and risk attitudes. And we delivered the research around the world. And it was really fun to work with Harry. And what I learned then was, despite the fact that a lot of these tools were available and then coming to market, there were a lot of people who didn't really understand how to fit it into what they do. There was usually a champion here or a champion there inside of a large organization that knew the technology and the information would be helpful and if efficiency improving, but there was no top-down governance kind of component And so there's a huge variation in perceptions, in attitudes, in practice. I mean, it was all over the place. It was really eye-opening to me to go through that process. Let's break that down a little bit more, because I think even today, there are a lot of institutions that in some way, shape, or form are using Mark Witz's mean variance optimization for asset allocation. So why don't we just start with the limitations in Mark Witz's model? I think it requires us to really take a step back and consider what the investments are actually there to do. So I always start with purpose. Let's think about institutions versus retail or or high net worth, but institutions, there are a lot of different people around the finance committee or investment committee table, if you will, all different backgrounds, different perceptions, experiences, et cetera, but they tend to agree why they're there. We're here to make grants, we're here to fund a pension. We're here to make sure that claims can be paid. So all everyone agrees on that. But a lot of the people around the table are not financial experts. They're non-professional investors. And so when you make the leap from purpose to objectives, it's very hard. Well, exactly what does that mean? How do we carry out the work is what the objectives are. And so, well, that means we're going to pay out X percent per year precisely, and we're going to grow by Y, and we're going to cover inflation. And we also have these commitments that we're making. Well, we also don't want to blow up our balance sheet. So these are considerations that become difficult for non-investment professionals to engage. And so what do they do? They turn to experts, consultants, and a consultant will tend to use a model like a mean variance optimization model. And so you can imagine why. The motivation is actually, it's got very strong theoretical grounding, you know, Nobel laureate thinking behind it. It's industry best practice. And it's actually elegant and simple. So the expert presenting the information to the non-expert group ends up really by default saying, you know, these are your two investment objectives. They are an expected return, and a standard deviation, so mean and variance, reward and risk. These are presumptive investment objectives. So the expected return being a point estimate may connect well into, I want to cover expenses and I want to grow and I want to pay fees. But the risk, meaning a variance and a standard deviation, only by some strange coincidence would be connected to the risk that the investor actually cares about. Like that's stunning. So what is standard deviation? What is variance to an investor who is looking at a balance sheet 
with a certain amount of, call it reserves, surplus, net wealth. It has a business to run, potentially. Those reserves are shared by the business and the investments themselves. Standard deviation doesn't matter. And so where do you go from standard deviation is, in practice, you turn to a benchmark. This was formed by a policy portfolio. Well, well, hold on. What if the policy portfolio is evolving through time and you're beating it, but you're really off track with what risk matters fundamentally? That's, that's really what we're saying here is the fundamental problem. Number one is it doesn't really connect well to what matters to you in terms of risk. Related to this is that most people don't speak that language. And so where have we gone? We've evolved to hundreds of variations on this theme of mean variance optimization. And so we're using more sophisticated measures, but then we have to calibrate a lot more information about preferences, for example, and other things that drive the model that we may know nothing about. So number two is, while being more sophisticated, it doesn't really buy us much. And people don't speak that language. They don't speak in statistical, abstract, sophisticated terms like this. And so even if it did, for whatever reason, connect exactly to the risks that matter, nobody's speaking that language. And really, you take those two things into consideration, that you've got risks that don't matter and you're speaking a different language. And then there's a third piece, which maybe models have evolved to accommodate this, but for most mean variance optimization problems, you're throwing away the most important information. <laughs> so think about making a decision about a loss limit over an investment horizon and you have a real balance sheet to protect, but you're not actually taking into consideration the fact that, of course, markets draw down a lot more than the normal distribution would tell you it would. And Along the way, you're going to experience something called sequence risk. So this is a period of time where returns are coming down over precipitously over a long period of time. So, so those two things are not captured in this decision metric either. So where does this leave us? So you show up without an investment background, with a math background, and you pretty quickly see, wait a minute, the main tool that starts this policy portfolio that's going to drive returns isn't like consistently thought of the right way from the presenter to the decision maker. What do you do with that? Well, it took me a long time to get there, by the way. <laughs> so it was a journey. I would say that I'm much more aware of that now. And partly it's because I've sat across the table as an advisor, but I've also been a trustee and I've been a CIA. So I, those things are lessons really about how people come to make decisions what information matters to them. And so for me, as a puzzler, I'm fundamentally kind of a problem solver puzzler, I felt like it was time to do something a little bit better. And I believed that it was possible. So that began the journey of high trade. Let's circle back. I want, I want to get there. Bef before we get there, what else did you see and learn in your long tenure at Wilshire? Great question. Uh, <laughs> I learned a ton. So I would say a couple of fundamental lessons that there is underlying and underpinning every investment, a set of common risks. It cuts across equities, it cuts across fixed income. Think about the large asset classes. There are some fundamental drivers and we tend to not talk about those. So the risk factors and today that language is used a lot more, but in the days of Wilshire and creating risk models, there was a strive toward work that we undertook to get that risk model fully described for the clients that we were working with, which was the asset manager. So think fixed income wasn't just duration, it was term, it was shift, slope, and curvature. It was credit, potentially other spreads that you could articulate. And in inequities, you have a fundamental model. The matrix that you're operating with, the description of risk was in the thousands of different factors. Well, that's helpful to someone who's trading a portfolio, say, of a number of stocks and bonds, multi-asset class. We brought those models to institutional investors 
But that's not at all the right way to approach the problem. They have different purposes. So portfolio construction, thinking about trading stocks and bonds and turning that portfolio over with a specific set of objectives is very different from trying to meet objectives as going back to purpose to begin with. And so I learned that bringing these very heavy, now call them point solution systems, and there are a lot of them in the marketplace that had moved into this world of allocators, basically, that are really not a good solution. And what they produce in terms of information, they're not making day-to-day portfolio decisions. So let's turn a little bit to your time at Farmers. And so when you left Wilshire, you're taking over as a CIO. How did you think about what that mission and purpose was and how you structured that portfolio? I joined as head of investments. I was recruited by a guy named Peter Teuscher, who was the chief investment officer at the time. The timing was perfect. He said, I'd like you to join Farmers Group. We need to transform the investment process. It was just after the global financial crisis, and there was a lot of work to do. And so imagine a balance sheet that had grown by acquisition. There was something like almost 50 balance sheets. And you know, there's a billion dollars in cash. There were state deposits all over the place. There was a lot to optimize, <laughs> potentially. And like a lot of institutions, proud of how conservative they were in their investments. So, so if you can't really measure where you are in terms of risk, and that means you can't really manage it. What you would tend to do, what a lot of organizations tend to do, is err on the side of less risk. So our mandate was to transform, put risk to work in a way that could grow the surplus, but manage the risk in that surplus. There was a lot of fun work to do there because it meant basically taking what was one manager who had existed a long time ago and had moved on to an asset management organization and bring in the right kinds of managers. So we had a lot of work to do to transform the balance sheets, to bring in the right managers, to put certain mandates to work. But it was also about process. There were seven different committees that we reported into, bringing them along. If we're going to make changes in a very large organization that way, we've got to bring all the people who are part of it. So that meant financial reporting, that meant accounting, that meant compliance teams. And and so what we learned is that all of those relationships also required a lot of work, just in terms of how they receive information, how they were working. A lot of it was manual. So there was a number of kind of fundamental transformative things in terms of the organization and how it functioned in addition to the investments. And we wanted everybody to be a part of it and, and feel successful. And they were. So it was a lot of fun. I want to make sure I understood. So at the beginning, you said there was one manager. Was that an internal manager or was that like one multi-asset external manager? So back in the day, and I don't remember exactly when this was, that group was literally on the floor where my office was. When I arrived and the team was much smaller, about nine people managing the process and this manager had 80% of the assets. So this internal group Ended up moving, I think it was Scudder at the time. And then Scudder had a relationship with Zurich, and Zurich, I think, swapped that asset with Deutsche Bank. So that team was at Deutsche Asset and Wealth Management. It was their insurance team. So we got to know those guys really, really well. It's sort of like another office. <laughs> so how did you transition from that one team to whatever it became? So we we said, all right, let's take a look at where we want the risks to be. And this meant, all right, let's get clear about what our objectives are. And then ultimately, when you're talking about risk and risk objectives, you're really talking about the available financial resources. So what can we actually put to work at? We're sharing a balance sheet with the insurance business itself, and those risks are much larger. So we had to have a place to start. We said, all right, we're going to have several billion that was available in terms of surplus. And then think about where maybe we don't have exposure, for example, to the liquid assets, number one. So is there an ill liquidity premium? Is there a risk that we can we take on here? So, so thinking about the different common factors that we wanted to put to work. And where did it end up? 
We started with municipal bond manager, then we moved into private debt, real estate, and then kind of variations within fixed income. Ultimately, throughout the whole organization, because there were pension assets and real estate assets as well, I think we ended up with about 30 managers overall. So it was the process that we went through was very innovative for its time. We made allocation decisions based on factors not on asset classes. So translating a factor approach to portfolio construction to a factor approach to asset allocation, the top down, one is bottom up, one is top down. And what's important to understand about that if you want to get the risk right is that let's take one of the factors, the major driver of portfolio risk is growth, equity growth. But that exists in equities and that exists in high yield, potentially, real estate, certainly private equity, and maybe even other investments. And so having a very clear picture of where that exists in all of the investments is really where you need to start. What other factors did you include in that construction? So taking a step back, we had some, what I would call kind of fundamental drivers of what we picked and also robust or statistical drivers for what we picked. And one of the things we wanted to make sure that we did was pick a sufficient set that people could understand, that we could operate with, that would make sense to the managers as well, and would be statistically robust, would explain returns, most returns over time, long term. So those included an equity factor, a duration factor, a credit factor. We had term, which was really representing inflation risk, commodity, and illiquidity. So very, very simple set. Wasn't just enough for us to think about describing the assets in the portfolio. We also wanted to describe the commitments. So if you're thinking about putting surplus risk to work, you have to think about what are the risks inside of the commitments themselves to changes in rates term or credit. Now, in property and casualty, it's fairly short duration. It's not like a pension. But we optimized that way. We said, okay, here are the risks, and we're going to match basically the duration and term and credit, and the rest can be put to work in these other factors in a balanced way. So that's how we approached it. And the framework is not necessarily one that would only apply to insurance or pension. It's a general concept. And if you shifted from an asset allocation approach to a factor approach, and you really wanted to get very clear on what the unique risks are that if you ended up in a crisis would tend to not be correlated, asset classes are, factors by construction are not, and those factors were custom to your process, wouldn't matter if you're a foundation, you're an endowment, you're a large sophisticated investor, you're sovereign wealth, There are a number of different investors who may decide to tweak one or two of those factors because it's appropriate to their particular case. And I think that's largely where we're headed in in the market for allocation, you know, thinking about how the world of investment management evolves with technology and better information. That's one of the things that I would see coming is a refinement of the problem and the information that we use to make better decisions. I'm curious how in a portfolio of external managers, once you've identified these factors, there has to be some mapping of the information you have at your disposal. In some cases, it might be security level, and in some cases, it might just be a, an infrequent return stream. How do you bring that together to have conviction that your exposures to a certain factor are accurate? That's a great question. (laughs) When we went through the manager search process, one of the things we asked for was a representative return stream, which is just one observation, time series observation of the distribution of that investment process, reflective of how they work and how they interact with markets. And so we would gather that information and run it through our model. So we were analyzing managers' performance 
as a part of the decision process, where were the factors in the strategy? Which factors? Were they significant? Were they not significant? Net of these basic common factors, was there something else that they were producing? Could we call that alpha? We weren't necessarily so interested in, again, defining every single one of the factors, but broad brush, could we take that into consideration? And were they productive? Net of some common factors, net of cost, was there something left? And there were a lot of managers that actually went through that process and had some performance. And and that, to our mind, was was useful information it would suggest to us that this is alpha and that it's consistent through time and here are the factors. So we never ran those analyses in a vacuum. We always shared the results with the managers that were presenting to us. And in many cases, they were surprised. They had never done this analysis in their own portfolios. And what we found generally was that a lot of times the factors would swamp the good work that they were doing on the individual positions in the portfolio. So all this great analysis and research being put into individual decisions, but macroeconomic effects or big deviations from maybe where their expectations for markets were going would just crush their performance. And so if you did an analysis for them, it was also a little bit of consulting. You know, hey, if you controlled these things, they're sort of an afterthought. (laughs) Maybe you would have better performance. So it was a really healthy conversation. What did you find trying to apply that same framework to, let's call it alternatives, particularly in the private markets where you don't really have a lot of data? Oh, yes, that's right. It is the case that there are products that don't have any history, even though they are using public market securities. Very similarly, if you have private markets or assessed values, you're going to run into similar kinds of problems. So what do you do in that case? So the conversation is, well, okay, so tell me what risk factors do you expect will drive your performance? Now, if a manager can't really tell you that, then you've given that manager just a wide open mandate and you don't know what you're going to get. So it's helpful and useful to have a conversation about what the expectations are going to be. So in some cases, we used those expectations and simply modeled. So if you have a time series of returns that corresponds to a factor and you have the expected exposures, then you have a place to start. And what about in like a traditionally thought of venture capital fund? So I don't know, you know, a return stream with like whatever it is, five bagels, three not so good, and one astronomical return. Like, I don't understand how you can think about mapping that to the same types of factors you'd use in the public markets. That is so specific to the fund that you're working with you really have to hold an index, something like 500 securities in order to know that you're going to actually hit one of those 0.5 home runs. So anyway, the work with respect to, say, private equity, bio, venture capital, the approach there has to be one by one by one. And so it becomes a conversation about, well, what kind of access do I have? These are more qualitative discussions than they are quantitative discussions. What kind of fund are we a part of? What's their track record? And what are their expectations? Net of fees. What is the chance that I'm really going to have something that's unique here? Could I model this as levered public equities, for example, if I know the leverage of the fund or I know the leverage the leverage inherent in the positions they hold? So after your time at Farmers, you go over to Two Sigma. So you finally made it to a hedge fund. Yeah, I did. I was recruited. Two Sigma was on a journey to do much more for their large and sophisticated clients around the world. There were a number of questions coming to Two Sigma about portfolios and portfolio construction, as you might imagine. I mean, here you have the world's premier data science hedge fund. They know a lot of things. They have a lot of very bright people and systems and processes. And so One of the things that attracted me to that was having a scientific approach to the investment process myself and having built a process that was, at farmers, highly productive. I thought, well, 
they want to take this intelligence and offer it to a much wider group of investors around the world. I thought that was very exciting. And it was also a little bit of what I wanted to do and see because being on a journey of creation and invention for me personally is that's me. That's what I like to do. Transformation, invention, and really having that opportunity on a much larger platform is hugely appealing to me. The work that I did there was exciting. We had a team of what I would call portfolio research analysts, these bright kids coming out of some of the best schools. And we had a team of engineers and taking the combination of the two to create effectiveness was really what that position was all about. And somewhere along the way, you decided to go off on your own. Yes, (laughs) I did. (laughs) There are different motivations, as you might imagine. However, with, say, a hedge fund and a very large organization and its purposes and its intentions versus what I ultimately wanted to do, which was to be independent. I felt like this is generally true in financial technology, especially there's huge value in having an independent voice and not being in a position of having to defend or deflect the fact that this technology was created by a firm that wants to sell these certain kinds of of products and solutions. I felt and feel very strongly that that kind of independence needs to be in place in order to be credible to fiduciaries. And if I wanted to make something that was of value to everybody, not just a select group of clients, that I needed to just bite the bullet and do it. And so now you come full circle to some of the quantitative metrics you were alluding to earlier. Why don't you talk about what you've developed since then? Maybe another step back is as a trustee of a, so I'm a trustee of a a public radio station and I'm the treasurer and chair of the finance committee. And I've been involved with that organization, gosh, I think almost 10 years now. Early, early days, I helped them to get out of an expensive managed account program and into one where the finance committee could kind of do it ourselves, which meant setting those objectives and having a very low cost program. And so early days, I wanted to take that very model and bring it to some of the most underserved, which would be the smallest endowments and foundations. So that was kind of where my journey began. And I thought, well, there's much more to the story here. Even if I create this effectively low cost product, I still want to be able to support better decision making. And so I was working on prototyping an analytical system, a decision system. And I ran into a problem. I thought, well, I could buy off the shelf of the invariance optimization tool, but I don't want to practice that anymore. Let's really do this well. So I approached a friend of mine at Caltech, JAXA Civitanic, and I've known him for a very long time. And I basically showed up one day and I said, we have a problem to work on together. (laughs) We're going to do this. (laughs) And I didn't know where it would take us. I don't want to assume what Ted's utility function is. I don't want to assume that mean invariants comprise that. That's one thing. Number two, I didn't want to assume that the world was normally distributed, that markets would behave now. Simple. Number two, I also wanted to make sure fundamentally that people could make trade-offs and risk in ways that they could understand it. So it's very nebulous. Well, what does that exactly mean? So all right, let's transform the language from a standard deviation or some other metric to a choice parameter that they could actually get, which is a loss limit. Thinking about percentage loss of their assets or portfolio. Let's just use that as a place to start. Okay, great. So we started to work on a model that would generalize those choices. So it wouldn't just be a loss limit and a return target, it could be a number of different objectives that you have. Hard objectives, I need at least to hit this return over this period. But maybe I have a stretch goal and maybe I care about that too. Maybe it's higher by two or 3%. I also care about not losing any more than X percent. So 
already we're generalizing the idea that you could have multiple objectives and then decisions made relative to those objectives. So I wanted to move away from this idea of a point estimate, expected return, to a probability because people understand probabilities. And so we said, all right, well, what might work is a simple summary measure where you have these set of objectives and you have the probability that each of them will happen. Well, okay, put a weighted average on those. What is that weighted average? That's your preferences. So there's an opportunity to have an interplay now and a discussion about preferences and these objectives that you'd like to hit in, in probability terms that everybody understands. So, so this innovation moving from a language about point estimates and, and your cane language to one where I'm talking about things that matter to me and I'm putting probabilities on those and I'm doing a weighted average. That's what pi is. That's a summary measure that you can set as a target. And there's a lot you can begin to do with it. So that's really where we started. But it wasn't enough to me to say, Ted, your portfolio has a 60% chance of hitting the objectives that you set on average. It wasn't enough to me because your advisor might come to you and say, hey, Ted, you know, I can actually improve this by 10%. What you might say as a trustee, how important is that? So is it, should I do it? Is that a lot? What I wanted to do was translate changes in those probabilities to dollars. So the second measure that we defined is a measure called ADA. I borrowed it from thermodynamics. <laughs> it was like the one Greek letter, <laughs> small letter H, not in financial services. I grabbed it. It's a measure of inputs to outputs, efficiency. And it is, ADA is the amount of money that you would need to add to your current portfolio in order to hit the higher probability portfolio. So it's a measure of value of moving from the 60% to the 70%. What is that worth to you, given your preferences, given your objectives? And so by design, it is tied to what you want, it's custom to you, and you can actually translate that value into dollars. So if you only changed, for example, the risk exposure of the portfolio, you could tell somebody what that is worth to them. That's powerful. That's informative. That helps to make a decision. And I think it does a couple of interesting things with respect to how an allocator interfaces with their portfolio in the market. If now you have a facility with the language of risk, that becomes your focus, not product, not even individual securities necessarily, but the chance of achieving the objectives you set. And so things like tail risk management, you can evaluate that. What is it worth to you? Well, hold on, this is worth a million dollars a year to me. I'm willing to pay a manager to do that and no longer sticks out in the line item as a sore thumb of I'm paying and paying, but I don't have any value. When you go in and you're working with someone and you're calculating their pie and their ADA for the first time, are there common things that you find that cause people to make change? Like there are sort of systematic biases across some traditionally structured mean variance portfolio that comes out when you start looking at these metrics? Yes. One of the things that happens is it changes the focus from, as I said, from product to overall risk. And so a portfolio that has a long list of managers can be reframed or restructured to one that's smaller and more efficient and easier to manage. And so one of the conversations is, well, can I get there more simply? Number two is they start to think about the probability of losing. And that's not something that they've, you know, what does is, what is losing mean to me? Is it, I don't ever want to lose anything. Am I willing to lose 5%? So there's a, a more fulsome conversation about 
the trade-off between growth and risk. How reliable have you found the numbers and the math that underpins the model that spits this out? So let me take a step back and describe how we've approached this. So PI as a framework, as a decision framework, can be parameterized as a model in a number of different ways. It doesn't have a prescribed distribution or say whether or not you have to use securities or returns or it's a very general framework. So what we've done is translated the PI decision framework into a system that uses what's called a regime switching model. Our goal was to not necessarily predict what was going to happen over the next five years, but give the range of potential outcomes in a way that would give a path experience that would be realistic. So what we have built really is a model that accommodates kind of two states of the world. One is kind of a normal market state. The other is a crisis state. And so there's a probability that you'll be in one state and move to the next, a good state moving to a crisis state. And then when you're in the crisis state, the probability that you'll move back. So it is possible to estimate the probabilities of being in those states using a very long history. And we know the probabilities change through time, but we started in a particular place, which was to use as much history and accommodate as many crises and policy responses, frankly, that have happened over this time that we have data. And so those two, if you will, regimes and the probabilities are informed by that data exercise, if you will. Getting into a little bit more of the meat, the way that we think about risk is through factors. So it is possible in the way that we've structured things to draw upon the returns that a manager would give you or that a portfolio has. But if it doesn't, it is possible to say, all right, these are what the factor exposures are expected to be, or we can estimate them if all the data don't line up to back cast so that we do have consistent information. So that's the approach. And what we found is that as compared to what's typically used, like a log normal model for allocation, there are measures of model fit and comparative model specification that tell you you have a better model and we do. So there are measures that say, yeah, okay, we're going to ding you for having putting more data here. We're going to ding you for adding more parameters. Taking all that into consideration is a much better description of how the world works. But suppose that you're a super user and you're the chief risk officer and you have views. There's no reason why you wouldn't be able to put in your own probabilities set your own means and variances for the different states and study. And that's really what it is about, is to study what the potential. So it doesn't replace people. It's a supportive decision tool. I know you started HiTree as a consultancy, and I'm curious how you thought about productizing this model. Should it be a software company? Is it a service? Yeah, we quickly moved from traditional consultant to (laughs) a very different kind of business. And yes, I thought about productizing and roughly falls into a few areas. And one of the things that if you were a trustee sitting around the table, you might ask is, what's the probability I'm going to hit my objective? Because you don't know that today. You just don't know. So that's where we're getting a lot of questions is, can you run a diagnostic? So that for us is an important product because it it begins the conversation about the framework and it extends to other people what we're doing. It's a word of mouth thing. It's a lot of fun to work on those projects. People feel really good when they've gone through them like because you can't just offer the model. You actually have to help them with the decision problem that they have. The reason why I feel very strongly that this work in this model and the metrics that we've created need to be independent is that at some level, this could be a monitoring product. In other words, this gets reported out to an investment committee independent of the consultant or independent of who's ever at the table as a a strategic target. So the board members don't have to focus on, say, you know, that particular manager at this time or look backwards, but rather where are we headed? 
that's the board's mandate, if you will, is the strategic objectives of the organization and are we on track? So maybe a high monitoring score type product. In your initial work with this, have you seen the conversations in the boardroom change from the old, why is that manager underperforming to, well, if we take that manager out, what does it do for our metrics? That's exactly the questions that are being asked. And so we're just getting started. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more use cases to talk about. But because the system allows for the question, what if we add the alpha? Does it add anything to the outcomes? Do we really contribute to the outcomes? So that is a question that easily can be studied. And as I said earlier, net of those common risk factors, is there anything really being produced is ultimately the question that's, that's embedded in the model and being asked. So one of the pieces of alpha that we share are the factors and what the alpha estimates are. It's very easy to begin the conversation. Well, I'm not sure that that's really productive. I'm not sure that this is really our focus. What I think that What's exciting to me is that a lot of the people in the organizations that I've worked with start to say, well, why are we having conversations about this or that? Why are we doing that? Why are we spending all of our time talking about individual strategies and individual deals and individual decisions that a manager has made when we have a a portfolio that's comprised of maybe 10 or 20 managers and we're not at all talking about where we're headed. And it's never been more important to do that. How do you think about the spectrum of effectively competition and cooperation in what you're doing? From the very beginning, I did not feel it was beneficial to create another organization to compete head to head with the existing players. First of all, the industry, as you probably know, is changing a lot. So you have consultants that have moved into asset management through outsourced chief investment officer products. You have asset managers moving into advice in the same business. So there's a huge amount of crossover coming from different capabilities. Ultimately, there's just a lot of change. And then you have a number of asset managers that are reconsidering who they are, may already recognize that given data science techniques and and some of the technologies that are being applied in the asset management life cycle have changed the game and they haven't changed. So they're rethinking about, all right, what products are we really bringing to market? Maybe we don't bring products anymore. Maybe we bring solutions. And so, so you have this kind of very interesting world of change. And so I said, all right, let me take a step back. How would I empower this world that's changing? I don't want to compete. I don't want to create something new. So the way that we're working is to facilitate that change, to put the technology into the hands of the practitioners. I don't want to be in a position of serving the hundred clients directly. I would much rather put this in the hands of the practitioners already out there who have established businesses, but know they need to do more. That's a win. The other side of it is, and very interesting side of it is, There are a number, as I said, of asset managers who have, in contemplating their next life, effectively, who are coming to us and saying, hey, how would we look inside of a portfolio? And I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that asset managers would be curious about that, but it's super interesting. So if you have a way of characterizing your future state of your portfolio and you know that hitting a certain set of risk exposures improves the outcomes like really can shift and change and shape the outcomes that's a different conversation with asset managers today there is the potential to tap an organization and say i can't get what i need off the shelf It's not going to come in the form of an ETF. But what I need specifically, given my objectives, my desire to hit those objectives, is a very specific portfolio that you can shape and build for me. That is a game changer and why I think this has potential. 
So now you've got an organization that can evolve to actually provide a solution as a service, not as a passive product and not as an active product. So that's the change that I'm hoping that this will facilitate is is the conversation about ever customizing your needs and capturing efficiency. If you make it this far each week, you're probably ready for the closing questions. But wait, there's more. If you sign up for a premium membership, you can access our premium feed, which includes an additional set of closing questions each week and removes all the ads from the show, including this little pitch to subscribe. Hop onto the website to sign up. Thanks, and let's get on with it. Great. All right, Karen, I want to turn to a couple of closing questions. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? That would be gravel bike riding. (laughs) Do you know what gravel bike riding is? I don't. I imagine you're riding a bike on gravel, but it sounds like there's more to it than that. Yeah, it's a little bit. So it's a hybrid. It's not a road bike. It's not a mountain bike. It's a bike that you can take on the road, but then if you find a great gravel route, you can just hop on it and go. (laughs) That's what I love. So my husband and I do that a lot. We have a lot of friends in the biking community. We're very involved in biking and Davis Finney Masters team and things like that. So so definitely bike riding. And over the weekend, you would have found me north of Ojai biking. And it was adventures in biking with Karen. It was 108 degrees. But (laughs) yeah, that's what we do and have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. What's your most important daily habit? Okay. Most important habit, making a cappuccino. (laughs) So literally rolling out of bed, petting the dog on the way to the coffee machine where I'm turning it on. And it is for me about the art and the experience and just, it's not so much what it tastes like, although it tastes great, it is the process of making it and then starting the day. That's my most important kind of. (laughs) What's your biggest pet peeve? So right now, my biggest pet peeve are bots. (laughs) And so think end of the day, long day, you're reading the news. And I don't know about you. I haven't trained my robot very well. I'm getting news. I'm getting information from bots. It is absolutely absurd. And some of it I've seen. And I I keep telling my bot, like, stop. But it's a pet peeve of mine to continue to be bombarded with information and news that is just meaningless. And, And yeah, it really annoys me. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My father was a scientist. He was a microbiologist and research scientist. And I would say, fundamentally, he was an explorer. And we grew up in Arizona before a lot of people were there. And he would take us on the weekends, all three of us, and just go out. And we would experience things. And it, it wasn't necessarily that, like there was a plan. We just we enjoyed and we experienced it. And I remember having a conversation with him once. I don't know. I think it was in graduate school. And maybe this is the time when you start to ask your parents, like, what do you really think about the world? <laughs> and I said, well, if you could have changed anything about what you did, what would it have been? He said, I would have taken more risk. I would have tried more things. I would have put myself out there. And I took that to heart. All right, last one, and then we'll do a few more for our premium subscribers. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I wish I would have understood myself better earlier in life. Kind of fundamentally who I am. I feel like I really know that well now, and that's probably through a lot of different experiences. And maybe we can't really play that game of, well, if I knew, I I wouldn't have ended up here. But from a very young age, I was a puzzler. I I just sort of puzzles. I'm sort of known in the neighborhood as being the puzzler. And I was a crafter. So I I did crafts, I did puzzles, I was problem solving all the time. And so I think fundamentally, from the very beginning, I was an inventor and an engineer. And it took me a long time. I'm in my 50s and I'm starting to do this. Although, you know, I I did it inside of organizations. I'm now embracing it fully and it feels fantastic. That's great. Karen, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. 
If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. Thank you.